Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for this year's Sports Awards. Uh, we've got a packed evening for you, um, so I hope that you're settled in in front of your screens with plenty of refreshments and some healthy snacks. Um, this is a bit different perhaps than what we may have done in the past for uh, the Sports Awards. Although for me, this is quite normal because it's my first one. So um, I do apologize for making you sit in front of a screen, but just think of it as a Friday night movie. <clears throat> Again, I apologize for the state of my hair. I haven't had a uh, decent haircut for a few months now, but I thought I'd make up for it by wearing uh, quite a nice dinner suit just to uh, make myself smarten up for the occasion. So whilst this year has been um, pretty disrupted by biblical weather and a global pandemic, there's plenty to celebrate from a sporting point of view. Tonight is an opportunity for the girls to recognise their efforts and their successes. Um, and this evening is dedicated to all of those girls who have represented Godolphin School in some sporting endeavour, as well as every single girl that's taken part in PE lessons and after school clubs and before school clubs and lunchtime clubs, whether it's yoga, lacrosse, uh, basketball, whatever it might be, um, this evening is dedicated to you. Um, most of this evening will be um, hosted by the girls themselves. I won't be saying an awful lot, but I will try and pull things together. Um, our senior captains will review the season in their own words. Our head sports scholar will share her experiences of sport at Godolphin um, throughout her school life. And we'll also recognise those individual achievements as well as team performances. In addition, we've got two fantastic speakers. Um, later, we'll hear from Salisbury-based polar explorer Wendy Searle, um, who will share her experiences in becoming only the seventh woman ever in history to ski solo to the South Pole. Uh, but first, we will hear from GB Olympic athlete Marilyn Okoro. Now, uh, Marilyn has um, we grew up in, a, in northwest London where she took um, up running in school and uh, at that time it was simply just to be fit for her first love sport which was lacrosse. Marilyn uh, was also a keen tennis and netball player and enjoyed all sorts of different activities and she believes that her diverse background in sport is reflected in her versatility in athletics. Indeed while she specialises in the 800 metres she's also competitive in 400 and 1500. Marilyn went on to represent Great Britain and Northern Ireland um, or the England team for nine consecutive years. Highlights include a World Championship bronze, European bronze and silver and an Olympic finalist. Marilyn is five times 800 metres national champion and is the current national record holder for 600 metres and the 4x4 relay. Marilyn will share some of her experiences, the highs and lows, um, of her career and tell us more about she, how she remained committed to go on to be successful. Hope you enjoy her talk. two-time Olympian and I am just so over the moon to be able to share in your sports awards. Uh, I am a little bit sad that I couldn't be with you in person but hey we are making the best of every situation during these crazy times and you know it's such an honour for me and the Mintridge Foundation to be a part of your virtual sports awards so thank you so much. Um, I hope hopefully a date in the future we'll be able to meet in person. But for now, I'm going to hopefully inspire and encourage you all to just keep chasing those dreams. I'm going to be talking a bit on the subject of commitment during adverse times, which is very fitting for the, the days we're in right now. You know, lockdown has really changed a lot of things and it's affecting everyone so differently. Even though we're impacted by the same sort of adversity right now, um, it, it affects us differently and we all respond to things differently. Um, and I always like to say in life, it's not necessarily what happens to you, but how you choose to respond to it. So as you listen to my story and my journey, I would like you to think about the following. And that is, you know, perhaps when you ponder about life and the things that you want to achieve or have achieved already, um, was it what you expected? And if not, was it what you needed? 
So perhaps life has not been what you expected, but was it what you needed? And that's something I think about all the time when perhaps I'm facing a bit of disappointment, um, a bit sort of in the dumps of, you know, where am I really going right now? Um, and it helps me just exercise the attitude of gratitude and, you know, really refocus and plan ahead for great things to come and still pursue my goals. Um, so for me, lockdown has been an incredible time of creativity. It's really given me the time to reflect on where I'm at, my journey, you know, in the past. It's given me great perspective, um, but also, you know, it's helped me plan ahead because I'm really determined to come out of lockdown the best version of myself possible. So today we're going to have a little insight into me as a person, me as an athlete, uh, my journey so far uh, and where I'm hoping to go in the future. So I've been on this earth a little over three decades, so I like to split it into three. And um, so to begin with the early days, I am currently residing in Wigan, um, but I originate from northwest London, an area called Stonebridge Park, which is literally tucked behind Wembley Stadium, uh, which is probably known better for football. However, I'm not much of a football player, so I ran around a lot. I had a bundle of energy, but life was really tough for me growing up. Uh, I am uh, the eldest of three other siblings. And my mum was a single mother who came all the way over from Nigeria to give us the best start in life that she possibly could. Uh, she was quite strict and she definitely shaped who I am today, um, but not quite in the way you might think. I do really, really, she's my first role model, to be honest, but um, she also was, I guess, my first and biggest critic. Uh, however, you know, life was really tough. Stonebridge is known for the high gang culture and crime rates. And everyone was just doing their best to survive. Uh, and for me, I just felt like there wasn't much hope and people weren't very happy. And I was just determined from a very young age to get out of there as however, it, however I could, whatever it took. Um, but also to explore that there was more to life. And I was just very ambitious from a young age and I was determined to make the most of my situation. Uh, like I said, my mum was uh, a very big part of my journey and catalyst to who I am today because she actually was my very first no. The very, you know, you, your parents always say no, don't they? Uh, but my mum, her no was, you know, it was no to my dreams and no to my biggest talent. And I couldn't understand it. And even though I was amazing at so many other things, she just wasn't sharing the vision I had for my running. So actually, I decided to turn that around and I decided that I was going to prove to her that I could be the best at whatever I set my mind to. So at 10 years old, I was given the blessing of going to a beautiful school, a boarding school, a girls school in Hertfordshire, and it's called Abbots Hill. And this is really where all my sporting dreams began. It was a playground of opportunities and the pastoral care was amazing. So perhaps any sort of neglect I was getting whilst growing up as a child, it was definitely being made up for at Abbots Hill. It was a tight knit community. I had, you know, the whole school knew each other. My year group was only 20, so we were all friends. Uh, <laughs> well, we had to be, um, but no, we were definitely, you know, very close, very bonded, and I got a lot of confidence in who I was as a person from Abbots Hill. But probably one of the greatest blessings my time at Abbots Hill was being told one day by my PE teacher, Mrs P, to go along to running club. So this was at the end of a game session where I was playing lacrosse, and lacrosse was my first love. I played a lot of sports at school. I, you know, basically our whole team was everything. So I played tennis, I loved lacrosse, I played netball, obviously athletics was something I found my natural flair in. But basically anything I could take advantage of, I was determined to just try it all and find out, you know, what really set my soul on fire. So I remember Mrs. P telling me to go along to running club and a bit complacent, I was thinking, well, why would I go to running club? I'm already a good runner. Um, but I'm really thankful that I did because I met one of the most influential people after my mum uh, in my career today. And that is my very first very first athletics coach, Mr. George Harrison. Now, George will always have a special place in my heart because he just loved the sport and that really resonated with me. And even though I was hating running up and down the muddy lacrosse pitches on a Friday afternoon, he just let me know that, you know, if you put the work in now, you can achieve anything you set your mind to. 
And I remember one particular really cold, really muddy, really just, ugh, what are we doing here on a Friday at 4.30 um, session? And he pulled me aside and I think he could tell my lacklustre attitude that day. And he said, Marilyn, look, you've got the talent to make it really big in running. You could go to the Olympics one day. My ears pricked at that. Uh, and he just said, you know, you look like you don't want to be here. So, you know, off you go. Uh, so I, you know, I really didn't want to let George down. He was someone that I'd grown really close to and he really rooted for me. So I don't like letting people down and I didn't want him to feel like I was wasting his time. Um, and I just remember from that day on, I was determined to always put 150% into everything. And if I didn't feel like it and if it was a chore, it perhaps wasn't for me. So he had sown that Olympic seed and, you know, challenge number two, I was going to run after it and chase it as best I could. Now, I told you about my mum. She was not impressed. She said, I didn't send you to school to run. You're going to be a lawyer or a doctor. So, you know, I was determined to prove her wrong, basically, and that I could, one, be a, you know, a great student with a bit of dedication and discipline and prioritising and asking for help as well. Our teachers were incredible and we, you know, were really cared for whether, whatever it was we chose to do. So from, a, you know, from 10 years old, I just ran with that dream, you know, and I've kept chasing it ever since. So Abbott's Hill was such a blessing. I continued to work hard. I got gr great grades. Um, it wasn't easy. Not all subjects were natural to me, uh, especially maths. But I worked really hard, um, achieved great grades. And I went to the University of Bath and I studied French and politics because I loved languages. Uh, and that was a real blessing because I got to travel and you know spend my third year studying in Paris um, and alongside this, I, you know, I kept up my athletics. I kept in contact with George and he would send me my training schedules. And it wasn't always easy. I had to be really, really disciplined. Uh, but I always reminded myself of what George had told me about going to the Olympics. Could I make this my reality? And I was definitely determined to try. So I'm so glad that George planted that seed because my final year of uni, I actually made, I actually made my first senior team to represent GB. And I haven't looked back since. I'm very proud to have rep represented the nation at every single major championships, indoors and outdoors. And I'm still going. The longevity of my career is something quite remarkable uh, because it hasn't always been easy. Whatever you're trying to achieve in life, there are going to be setbacks. There are going to be obstacles that come in your way. And, you know, they're going to test your strength, your faith, your belief in yourself um, and how much you trust your process. So this has definitely been something that I have been navigating for a while now. But, you know, the beginning of my career seemed it seemed so easy and it was a very natural path. And then the obstacles come. So for me, they would look like injuries. They would look like funding cuts. Um, they would look like people saying negative comments to me uh, because they could or they felt they could. Um, and I had to really mature as an individual and an athlete and realise the opinions of others couldn't dictate who I was. Um, I also had to realise that if I really wanted this bad enough, I was going to find a way. We've got an awesome ambassador, a Paris show jumper called Evie in the Mintry Foundation. And she always says, you know, find a way, not an excuse. And I think that's just echoes champion mindset, which is something I always go on about, which is just being willing to do whatever it takes to achieve your goals. And that was really, you know, my mindset and my spirit. And I, you know, I'm proud to say it still is. So in 2008, I made my first Olympic Games. And for me, that was just the most magical moment, crossing the line at the trials first. I'm one of the fastest 800 girls in the world because I'd overcome so much. Every injury I've had to bounce back from, it's not been easy, but it's given me an opportunity to learn about my body and reevaluate, you know, actually perhaps here was where I was pushing too much or perhaps here I should have trusted my gut instinct or perhaps here I should have communicated with my coach a bit better. Um, so, you know, there's... There are lessons that can come out of every season of life. And, you know, that's what it's all about. When you're facing something really difficult, you don't know how it's going to pan out. That's OK. Just stay in the present. Be mindful. Learn from the situation. There is a reason everything happens. Some other setbacks I've had to face would be things that were out of my control. Well, I feel like every setback really is probably out of your control to some extent. And so that's when you turn your mind to focusing on what you can control. However, one in sport that we know about is doping in sport, which is just, you know, ugh, there are no words. 
but I am a massive advocate for clean sport. It has impacted my career monumentally, um, monumentally even. And, um, you know, it's just something that in spite of being robbed of those moments on the podium, all the sponsorships that goes with it, I am glad that justice is being served. And, you know, the last time I received this beautiful medal I have here, my Olympic bronze that I had to wait 10 years for, this gave me so much confidence because it it instilled in something in me that I feel like I should have had all along. And it's something I want to tell you is that, you know, I am enough. You are enough. You know, often we just doubt ourselves. But how about we doubt our doubts? Like, how far can we go? I always love to talk about limitless you because it's really about how much you're willing to do whatever it takes to achieve your goals. So what would be my top three tips for you to stay committed in the face of adversity? I think I love little things that rhyme and sound good. So I've given you three P's. Uh, the first P would be perspective. You know, lockdown has really given each of us a time for reflecting um, and also just a time to be still. It's really important to be still. And what happens when you're when you're still is you gain a new perspective of whatever situation you're in. Um, and I think that's an amazing thing. For me, it was a rather positive thing because it actually, I, I had to think about a time just last year where I was so low, so down in the dumps. I didn't even want to get out of bed. I was really, really struggling with my mental health. Um, and I actually was wishing for a lockdown. Um, but now here I am still training for my goals and working for an awesome charity uh, called the Mintridge Foundation, which brings me to you guys. Uh, and it's really made me realize all the connections that I have. You know, it's important to reach out to others, uh, check in from time to time because your network is so, so important. Um, my next P would be to plan. You know, we have the time to plan, you know, it's important that we give ourselves some little check marks, stay accountable uh, and really, you know, identify what it is, give ourselves good direction of what we're trying to achieve and where we're trying to go. So goal setting is massive. Make sure you are writing some big goals that you're ready to smash and, you know, set yourself up for well, um, set yourself up really well for when we do come out of lockdown so you can hit the ground running. Uh, one of my main goals this year was Tokyo 2020. Um, of course, that is not going ahead, understandably. However, it's been pushed next year. So I needed to look at that and think, whoa, I've been given more time. You know, what athlete doesn't want more time? It means that now I can go back and really prepare my body. You know, I can take the time to do the little boring, tedious things that are going to make the biggest difference and make me so strong when I come back to running again. So that has been a really big blessing. So plan, plan, plan. I love notebooks. So, you know, get yourself a new notebook, even if you've got loads like me uh, and just scribble away with loads of plans. It also gives you something to look forward to, which is just the best thing ever. And finally, the final P would be to pursue Go after your goals, go chase them, and don't you stop until you've got them. Yeah, you stop when you're done, not when you're tired. When you're tired, you just sort of refuel and get back on it. Um, absolutely. So I'm a big, big advocate for dream chasing because you know what? I was a young girl from an area where, you know, my future was seemingly set out for me to, you know, have some children and maybe if I was lucky, get a council flat. You know, but however, I had big goals and I have run after them ever since. And it's not been easy. The hurdles have come um, and I've just kept squashing through those barriers. And that's what I encourage you to do as well. You know, if you've been given a dream, it's your dream. And so no one can tell you whether it's too big or too small. Uh, it's your dream for a reason. So you owe it to yourself. No one else really to chase after it with energy uh, and with purpose. So go pursue those goals. So back to the little thought I had at the beginning, you know, life right now doesn't look like anything any of us expected. But when we look back on lockdown 2020, can we say we used it well? Can we say it was what we needed at that time? And can we come out of this unlocking our dreams? It's been an absolute pleasure sharing this message with you. I hope it encourages someone. Uh, my final thing I would like you all to just remind yourself daily is, you know, I love a notebook. 
tell yourself, I totally got this. This is something I tell myself all the time because it's important that you believe in you. I believe in you. I know your support network believes in you. So go after your dreams. Never, never give up. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, some fantastic messages from Marilyn's experiences there. Uh, I wonder who your role models are, girls, and perhaps your role model is your mum or your sister, or perhaps you admire an international athlete or performer. Uh, maybe, as one of our girls in the lower school, you consider our senior girls as role models and aspire to be part of the first team lacrosse one day. Whoever your role models are, use them to inspire you to achieve some great something great. As Marilyn says, be the best version of you. Be limitless you. Now, we're going to move on to our first award section of the evening. Uh, in the first section, we will hear from Izzy Horsfield about cross country, Ellie Chalk about swimming, Flo Rousel about equestrian, Anna Merritt and Abby Littlejohns about athletics, and Lucy McCann about tennis. Over to you, Izzy. Hi, I'm Isabel Horsfield and I'm the cross country captain. Well done and thank you to everyone who has taken part in cross country this year. Our first events were a series of four Salisbury area races with Daisy Baker winning the individual bronze medal against a very tough age group and me winning the gold medal which wasn't too difficult seeing as I was the only senior girl running in the race. The under 17s, 15s and 13s all won team silver medals so well done to all of them. However, the season didn't start off too well for Mr Morton, who reverted into a garden fence after our first event. Daisy, Eleanor, Juliet, Flora, Maggie and I got selected to run at the Wiltshire County Championships. Despite arriving only a few minutes before the start, Daisy was very punctual to the finish line, securing second place. I came first out of the senior girls and luckily this time I was not racing against myself. Eleanor had a great race, coming ninth in her age group. Daisy, Eleanor and I qualified for the South West Championships, followed by the National Championships. Eleanor was the only one from Godolphin able to run. We are all very proud of her amazing achievement and she thoroughly deserved the opportunity to run for Wiltshire at national level. Another notable event was at Claysmore, where Daisy ran an outstanding race, coming first in her age group and second overall. Jess and I came third and second respectively out of the senior girls. At the Branston Relays, Eleanor ran the third fastest lap time despite losing her phone down the portaloo two minutes before the start of the race. Thank you to Jess, my co-captain, for your great support. And Eleanor, who stood in for me while I was taking my lease exams, the only subject it was worth revising for. A special thank you to Mr Morton for his improved bus driving and his great support and enthusiasm at all the events. And of course, thank you to Mrs Edwards for organising all the events and inspiring so many people to run. She will be greatly missed by the whole cross country team. Ellie Chalk, senior swimming captain. Whilst many girls compete for the school and at county, regional and national levels, swimming at Godolphin is available to all girls, whether it's for fun, fitness, life-saving or water polo. Godolphin competed against many local schools, recording overall wins against them all. Nationally, we competed in the SS Schools Relay Champs, where the teams gained valuable experience and team building. Despite a shorter season, a huge number of speed awards were achieved, 255 in total, 120 gold, 66 silver and 72 bronze awards, with over 250 PBs recorded, a credit to the school. Special mention goes to Amelia Johns, who broke the 50 metre breast, a record held since 2014. Maggie Coop breaking the 5th year 25 metre free and myself the 25 fly, 53 and 100 IM records. Covid meant we frustratingly did not complete the swimming season, however we still recorded amazing results with Amelia Johns competing in the 2020 county champs in the 50 and 100 breaststroke, finishing 5th in the 50 breast final with a time that would have taken her to regionals. Anna Norman achieved 8 county times and competed at the Wiltshire County Championships. Maddie Coop qualified for eight events and competed in five, achieving three PBs and finishing fifth in the 100 back final. 
Myself at the British National Champs in July last year, I reached the 50 metre freestyle final. This qualified me for the cancelled Olympic trials. I was selected to compete for Wiltshire in the National Intercounty Championships in Sheffield and I swam at the short course winter regionals, obtaining six PB times. At the 2020 Wiltshire Champs, I won gold and became senior county champion for 53, breaking the age group record in the time of 26.88. 100 freestyle, 50 back, 50 breaststroke. I also achieved two silvers and one bronze. And I qualified for the seven events for the South West Ingham Regionals. I would like to thank Mrs Addison for all her hard work and support this year. Finally, congratulations to all the girls for a very successful year. Hi, my name is Flynn. I'm the captain of Equestrian. Despite our season unfortunately being cut short, there are lots of successes to celebrate. Um, here are some of the girls' highlights over the past year. Chloe Lemieux won the Supreme Pony of the Year at Hoys in October and has also had a successful show jumping season. Alice Tregoning has also been successful show jumping. After working very hard to qualify for lots of classes, she then went on to win both the 90 and the 100 show jumping at the NSCA finals in October. And this is the first time Godolphin has ever had two individual titles. We had a good group of girls going to the national championships, including Alice Tregoning, Dorothy Mallison Rob, Agatha Mallison Rob, Isabel Morris, and Tabitha Turner, who all went on to jump very well. So well done. Some more notable results of, from Godolphin girls were at Stoddart. Tilly Swanton came sixth in the 90 and Scarlett Small got a best dressage. Another success is Bella Butterworth, who competed in the under-18 Southwest team at the British Eventing National Championships at Brickley, where the team won. During the spring term, we also had a group of girls playing polo at Druid's Lodge, who also had lots of fun. I'd like to say well done to all the girls as you have produced some amazing results representing Godolphin and I hope during this time you've all been able to spend some quality time with your ponies and are desperate to get out jumping again soon. Well done. Hi, my name is Anna and I am co-captain of Athletics. Due to coronavirus, we haven't been able to have a summer athletics season this year. Inventively, Mrs. Abrams came up with the Godolphin Athletics Challenge. Although we had at least one participant in each age group, special mention has to go to the second years who put in lots of effort every week. We would also like to thank all the staff who got involved, especially Mr. Clark and Mrs. Drummond for their support. After the sports awards last year, Abby Littlejohns, Alyssa Finnis and I went to the English School's National Championships representing Wiltshire. Abby competed in the 80 metre hurdles and came 18th in her first year there. Alyssa, who also had never been to this event before, came 24th out of two very strong packed heats. Hi, I'm Abby Littlejohns and I'm the co-captain of Athletics. Anna Merritt placed second at Hammerthrow in Nationals 2019, advancing onto internationals gaining her England best. At this meet, she won silver medal with a massive throw of 56.12 metres. Anna Merritt also teamed up with Owen Merritt to create the Merritt vs Merritt charity challenge. They went head to head in a nail-biting hammer throw contest, raising over a thousand pounds for wheelchair air ambulance. Godolphin girls participated in the Godolphin athletics challenge with each entry earning a house point. Douglas with 38, Methuen with 31 and Hamilton with 29. 29 of these Godolphin girls will advance to Wiltshire School's virtual championships held on 13th of June. Huge thanks go to Mrs Edwards for making this possible and also to Izzo for all her hard work and effort put into pre-season athletics in the spring term. Hi everyone, I'm Lucy and I'm the tennis captain of this year. Sadly, because of the current situation, the tennis season did not get to take place and so there were no matches. However, I'm sure it would have been an amazing season as so many people have been having lessons throughout the year. Everyone has been working really hard. I knew that last year all the Godolphin teams were very successful, so I'm sure that this year would have been even better. The coaches tell me that everyone has improved and have been putting so much effort into their lessons, with special mentions for Hannah Ridd, Tina He, Artemis Sang, Jemima Bentley, Nina Hill, Lily Bowton, Matilda Crawshaw, Isabel Lanny Steele, Lexi O'Gorman, Alice Tregoning, Gabby Price, Chloe Lemieux, Grace Cook, Millie Corbin and Olivia Bai. I want to say a massive thank you to Godolphin's amazing tennis coaches, Joan, Janie and Isla, who have been on the courts all day every day, come rain or shine, 
and have helped us all improve our tennis skills so much. I also want to say thank you to all the sports teachers who were ready for the season and, and had organised the matches for us to play. I know that all the tennis coaches are really sad to see the upper sixth and fifth year leavers go, but they wish you all the best for the future and hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for listening and I can't wait to see you on the courts next summer. Ooh. Thank you, Lucy, uh, and thank you to all of the girls that participated in those five sports throughout this year. Now, it comes to me to announce the winners of the most improved athletes and most valuable athletes in each sport. Uh, the most improved athlete goes to those girls that have developed the most during the course of the year, and the most valuable athlete goes to those girls that have made the greatest contribution to their teams or to their sports during the season. So, the winners are, for cross country, seniors, most valuable athlete, Izzy Horsfield. In the intermediates, the most improved athlete is Amy Condor. The most valuable athlete is Eleanor Crawshaw. For the juniors, most improved athlete is Sophie Lamb. Most valuable, Juliet Lamb. And in the minors, most improved athlete is Dorothy Robb. And the most valuable athlete, Laura Drake Burrows. Congratulations girls. In swimming, the most improved swimmer in the seniors is Flora Dennis. The most valuable swimmers in the seniors are Ellie Chalk and Maddie Coop. In the under 15s, most improved swimmer Amy Condor. Most valuable swimmer Lottie Miller. In the under 14s, the most improved swimmer is Helena Stowe. The most valuable swimmer Sophie Windsor. In the under 13s, most improved swimmer is Maddie Giffey, and in the most valuable swimmer is Amelia Johns. And for the under 12s, the most improved swimmer is Phoebe Parker, and the most valuable swimmers are Maddie Farbrother and Caitlin Miller. Congratulations, girls, well done. One final award in swimming uh, goes to the most enthusiastic swimmer. Uh, this is someone that's made a, a really special contribution, is a real team player, and always a positive influence on the other girls in, in their sports. And this year, the most enthusiastic swimmer goes to Maddie Coop. Congratulations, Maddie. Going on then to equestrian. Uh, for the seniors, the most valuable performer is Flo Rousel. In the under 16s, the most valuable performer, Alice Dragoning. In the under 15s, the most improved performer is Jess Croxford and the most valuable performer, Georgie Torrey. In the under 14s, the most valuable performers were Tilly Swanton and Agatha Robb. In the under 13s, the most improved performer, Sophie Lamb, and the most valuable performer, Tabitha Turner. And in under 12s, most improved performer is Maddie Hanslip, and the most valuable performers are Isabel Morris and Dorothy Robb. Congratulations, girls. In athletics, uh, for the seniors, the most valuable athlete was Anna Merritt. Uh, for the intermediates, the most valuable athlete, Alicia Finnis. For the juniors, the most improved athlete was Eliza Hemphill. And the most valuable athletes, Juliet Lamb and Sophie Lamb. In the minors, the most improved athlete was Orla Hill. And the most valuable athlete, Caitlin Miller and Elsa Edgecombe. Congratulations, girls. One final award in athletics, again, similar to swimming, the most enthusiastic athlete or the Venn Edwards Cup. Uh, this is similar, goes for the most enthusiasm, the most positive influence um, across the whole season. And this year it goes to two athletes. The most enthusiastic athletes goes to Sophie Lamb and Juliet Lamb. Congratulations, girls. Very well done. Thank you for all of your efforts.
Uh, and now we move on to our second speaker of the evening, Wendy Searle. Uh, Wendy made a decision in 2015 to ski to the South Pole. With a full-time job and four children, Wendy had no time, no money, no experience. She'd set herself a seemingly impossible challenge. But five years later, on the 8th of January, earlier this year in 2020, she became only the seventh woman in history to ski solo and unsupported from the Hercules Inlet to the South Pole. Completing the journey in 42 days, Wendy skied for up to 12 hours a day with no rest days and arrived at the pole with one pudding and a whisper of fuel left, in her own words. The aim of her expedition was to inspire others, especially women and girls, and to overcome challenges and to reach their long-term goals. Wendy believes that we can learn so much from her adventure and shares her lessons on bravery, success and self-belief. Her talk will cover um, all aspects of the expedition, including how Wendy made her vision a reality through years of hard work and training. I hope you enjoy her talk. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for having me to the Godolphin Sports Awards. It's all a bit of a weird virtual world that we're in right now, but I'm speaking to you now from my bedroom and can't show you lots of beautiful slides, but if you can imagine as we're going along throughout the talk, uh, some snowy wastes, lots of ice, um, sometimes not being able to see anything at all and you're sort of somewhere close to um, imagining what it was like for me. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and my expedition and really then what it means, you know, so what? What does it mean for you guys um, still at school and um, obviously with the interest in sports? And then hopefully we'll have some time for some questions at the end. So a little bit about me. I'm 42. I live in Salisbury, just down the road from Godolphin, actually in Harnham. I have four children and the oldest is 21, the youngest is 11. And uh, I have an office job. I have a nine to five job um, as a civil servant. So you could probably say that I was just more or less Mrs. Mrs. Average, an average, completely average person. But in January this year, so on the 8th of January this year, I skied into the South Pole in Antarctica and I became the only the seventh woman in history to complete that journey solo, uh, completely on my own and unsupported with no outside help or resupplies or anything like that. So just to put that into context, I think more than 4,000 people have climbed Everest and uh, they, they have put 12 uh, people on the moon. So more people have walked on the moon and they're all men, incidentally, more people have walked on the moon than have done that journey as I did it. So how did I go from <clears throat> being Mrs Ordinary um, and, you know, not having had, done, had an experience, I, I couldn't ski, I had no time, I had no money. Uh, how do you kind of go from a sort of standing start like that to, to even reaching the start line of the expedition? And I'll come back to that later. But what was the expedition? So... It was a 715 mile journey from a place called Hercules Inlet, which is on one of the floating ice sheets, the Ron Ice Shelf in Antarctica, from there to, to the South Pole, more or less due south. Uh, it was all uphill. So you start off at sea level and the, the South Pole is actually just under 10,000 feet. So really quite a lot of altitude involved in that. But because you're traveling very slowly, the uh, the altitude generally doesn't tend to affect people too too badly, but it's still if you just flew into that that point, it, you'd really notice it. It's it's, it's a, a big uphill drag the whole way. So you're travelling uphill, um, generally into wind because the wind, the area of low pressure at the pole, makes sure that no matter where you're coming from, you're generally walking into wind. Um, and then I had all sorts of environmental factors to deal with. Obviously, it's really really cold. I was going to Antarctica during their summer so our winter um, um, and the temperatures range from sort of more or less freezing which was actually far too hot down to about minus 30 minus 35 which was extremely cold not really warm enough to stop for any length of time and if you did you, 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 know, you soon lose the feeling in your hands and so on so I have the the uphill the interwind the extremely cold temperatures and then uh, you, you're, there's a risk of crevassing where the ice opens up under land underneath some of them can be a few 
uh, meters across some of them could, will be big enough to swallow whole cathedrals with room to spare so it wasn't a no risk expedition um, as well as all of those things is all the normal things of being you know out in in the outdoors burns scrapes falls you know all of that kind of thing all the medical stuff to worry about so and then and then I was completely on my own so I had to, had to take everything I needed with me in a it was like um almost looked like a boat uh, it was called a polk or a sledge and in my polk I had um what I needed everything I needed to survive uh, I had a, a tent to sleep in every night and <clears throat> everything was about weight so because I had to drag it along behind me the lighter it could be the better and I had this tiny little tent and it just if you know if I ever get to show it to you you'll see that it's a sort of flimsy bit of canvas and a couple of tent poles and that was my protection from the elements and uh, I have to say it did a fantastic job but you look at it and you think this is you know this is my shelter for uh, from from the sort of uh, terrible conditions in Antarctica it wasn't a lot as well as that I had all the food that I needed so my food was um, mainly dried rations which I then melt snow in the morning and evening rehydrate it into a almost like a pot noodle but uh, definitely kind of more calories and more nutritionally balanced I would say um, and so I had that morning and evening and then I had sort of chocolate nuts and dried fruit to keep me going during the day so what was my daily routine like so I, I set off uh, day one when they dropped me off in a little ski plane in the middle of nowhere and said right you know that's you goodbye um, so I set off skiing and I skied for um, initially sort of seven eight nine hours a day but quickly building up to 11 and a half 12 hours most days um, and uh, every single day was was the same in that sense um, the environment felt really different every single day and you, it's hard to imagine how that could be when you see photographs of it it just looks like 360 degree white horizon um, and you can often feel really different on any given day as well so it could be that you have an amazing day one day and you feel great and you've made loads of progress and you're feeling pretty pretty chirpy and then the next day you can feel so tired and fed up and um, you kind of just want to want it all to be over and there's no kind of rhyme or reason to it so some days can be really terrible but then the next day is okay again or you know or vice versa and, and you can, what you learn is that uh, no matter what you know you know that it's going to change eventually so it's not like a linear thing where the more tired you get the more fed up you get and you know it's sort of you kind of go downhill it's more like a kind of um, curvy wave I guess so 715 miles um, of that and uh, it took me 42 days I think 16 hours 23 minutes I can never quite remember um, to do that so I wanted to give you a few facts about Antarctica quickly so just to give you a bit of context and uh, this is where I'd normally show a lovely map because if you look at a normal flat world map you just see a bouncy line along the bottom uh, it doesn't look like very much but Antarctica is absolutely vast and extreme in every regard so uh, the continent itself is uh, twice the size of Australia uh, it's the highest the driest the windiest place on earth it has no permanent residence so you can't go and live in Antarctica the only way you would get to go in, to Antarctica is either as um, a tourist stepping off a ship and probably back on again pretty soon afterwards um, as a uh, scientist so if you're really keen to get to Antarctica it's a lot easier to go as a scientist than it is as an expedition because it's very expensive or as a private expedition which is what I was doing and um, so this 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 place is like otherworldly you know it doesn't even have its own time zone so when you go you just adopt this time zone of wherever you feel like really um, and because it's 24 hour daylight when I was there it's got this weird kind of it could be at any time any day you know the outside world almost didn't matter and it certainly felt like that when I was skiing along that days of the week definitely did not matter uh, hours of the day as long as it was um, reg regulating my skiing during the day that's the only sort of reason why time matters so you're kind of in this almost kind of it's almost like being on another planet almost and it's just such a ma massive massive privilege to be able to go and be there and do something like that I was very very fortunate um, to, to actually kind of get to go to this place 
So that's a little bit about Antarctica, a little bit about the expedition. Um, but so, but I didn't just wake up one day and think I'm going to go and ski to South Pole. If only it were that easy. So um, as I said, it's, it costs a huge amount of money to uh, to get to Antarctica, and I didn't, you know, I'm not I'm not a wealthy person. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not from a sort of adventure family, nothing like that. So I had to go out to companies and and ask for ask for them to sponsor me. Uh, and that was quite a difficult thing to do, certainly as a British person, but also as a woman. I think we're not very good at kind of blowing our own trumpet about saying, you know, come on, this is I'm amazing. Uh, sponsor me. So um, I kind of got around that by saying this expedition is amazing. You should get involved in this. So, <clears throat> so I, I was at a standing start five years ago in 2015 when I met this team that did a crossing of Antarctica. And before then, I didn't really know that polar travel was something people did or still did. Uh, I can't honestly say that if you'd asked me about Shackleton or Scott that I really have known um, very much about them at all. So it wasn't like this was a, a long held dream. And I think that's really important. It's a really important lesson for um, for us all going through life is that, you know, it doesn't have to be, I've always wanted to do X or Y. Um, opportunities can come along, you can kind of and it happens, the number of people that you talk to that just end up kind of almost stumbling into something rather than deliberately setting out to do something. But it, that's as much about taking and creating opportunities as it is about, um, you know, just, just kind of uh, accepting that life is, isn't is always, you know, you're, you're, you know exactly what you want to do. You've done it by the time you're 18. And if you haven't, you've, that's completely you written off, you know, thinking about the sports awards, I was not. I was definitely kind of, I said I was no, Mrs. Mrs. Average, I was absolutely Mrs. Average at school. I wasn't, you know, first pick, I think I was probably on the B team for netball. I did a bit of gymnastics, but I would never have described myself as an athlete at all, um, probably until about two, three years ago. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not that um, you can kind of, you have to approach it in a linear way and that you can have it all. I mean, I, you know, I have got, kids and a busy job um, and I think you can have it all at different times but probably not all together um, so you know there's there's always an opportunity throughout our lives to uh, to go and pursue those those big dreams so five years ago I met this team and I decided that that was something that I was really the more I read about it and the more I went and spent some time training with them because I was doing some work for them that I thought this is something incredible this is something so different this is something I want to be involved in I read some polar history um, the first uh, man reached uh, the South Pole in 1911 first first woman or team of women didn't reach reach the South Pole until 1969 and it certainly used to be the case where people thought that women should not be in Antarctica at all and I'm really glad to say that it's a lot more um, equal now it's a lot more diverse there are tons of women doing expeditions, tons of women doing polar guiding, um, science work down there. So we've come a long way from people people thinking that women would kind of just, uh, I don't know, break in two or something when they when they went to Antarctica. Um, so once I met this team and decided that that was what I wanted to do, there was basically a massive sort of gap of nothing between where I was in terms of experience, money, time, all those things and actually even getting to the start point. So I knew what I had to do to fill that gap because I talked to everybody that I could think of. Everybody that had ever had a connection to Antarctica that had been. Um, I set about getting myself some training and you have to kind of have a polar CV if, they want, if they're going to let you loose on, uh, on Antarctica on your own because the, the logistics company are sort of responsible for getting you in and out, getting you back safely. So I then did some uh, training at, at, um, in sort of snowy places. I went off to Norway for a couple of weeks. I learnt very approximately how to ski. Uh, and uh, then I went and did a crossing of Greenland. So that was a, in itself is a pretty epic expedition. And it's almost another talk in itself because um, although I was part of a team, it was absolutely the hardest thing that I'd done at the time. 
but before that the two weeks training in Norway was the hardest thing that I'd done at the time so I think there's a really important lesson there that 27 days in Greenland and every kind of weather you can possibly imagine uh, was what I thought was and was at the time was at the limits of my comfort zone but the only way to stretch your comfort zone is to take that next step and put yourself right out of your comfort zone in order to see what you can achieve and that is part of the nature of challenge in whatever regard whether it's a polar journey or to the south pole or whatever it is is that if you knew absolutely that you could complete it it wouldn't be a challenge um, so you know the, the fact that there's almost a, a you know there's, there's a, a risk of failure um, is actually quite an important part of um, those kind of expeditions so Greenland was 27 days um, of sort of hurricanes and bad conditions and all sorts of things like that um, but then I was still to go to Iceland so I <laughs> I went into the office in Iceland with the team that was going to get me up onto the glacier there and there was a, an Icelandic adventure type guy in there, had a great big bushy beard, looked like a Viking and he said, oh, training in Iceland for Antarctica, are you? Ha -ha, maybe you should be training in Antarctica for Iceland. And I was like, oh, don't be silly. Uh, and he was absolutely right. It was like the most horrendous co collection of conditions and uh, there was there was an avalanche risk, there was um, there was crevassing, there was um, uh, complete whiteout, there was blue ice, there was absolutely everything you can possibly imagine. And I think for me, the really big lesson for that, it was only kind of six days or something, was learning to trust my own judgment. And I think that's one of the hardest things and most, most difficult things to learn because it's so unnatural. I think especially now it's quite relevant because we're, we're used to conducting ourselves in a social grouping of some sort whether it's work or sport or school, even at home, we don't tend to make decisions alone. And lots of work shows that making group decisions is better in any case. But um, having to rely on your own judgment, even if you kind of already knew the way you wanted to go, do we ski over there? Do we stop here? Um, actually having someone else to kind of confirm or, you know, challenge you or all those things is, is just how we're how we tick so not having that was was probably a massive lesson for me and I probably learned more on that trip than perhaps on some of the other longer trips so Iceland was done Greenland was done um and then I was flying into Antarctica and it was just the most incredible experience because I've been working towards it for so long just being given this special boarding card for the the uh, the plane to Antarctica was was incredible um, and you start off in this kind of logistics based camp uh, with loads of other people and then they they drop you off um, at the start point and I was so worried I'm you know quite actually probably quite apprehensive and a little bit scared um, that things were going to go wrong and I was worried about breaking my leg uh, getting hypothermia um, getting lost skiing the wrong direction falling down a crevasse there was t the, the tent burning down um, running out of food there were so many things that I was worried about and a lot of those things were things that I probably didn't need to have worried about. And I learned a really valuable lesson about um, believing in myself, which is something I was telling myself before I went. And a lot of people were saying to me, oh, you know, you've got this. We know you're going to be amazing. But I think I was the one that didn't believe that. Um, and the fact that none of those things went wrong, you know, I was, I'm still kind of surprised now looking back on it. Uh, but what I sh really should have been worried about was the mental challenge. And that kind of brings us on to the, the kind of theme of resilience in sport. So physically, it was really hard. You're pulling a, a pulk, the sledge, which weighed 86 kilos at the beginning of the trip. Um, you're pulling for it for 11, 12 hours a day. You've got, there's only you to put the tent up. There's only you to fix things that go wrong. And, you know, it's, it's physically draining. I lost about 12 kilos. Um, if one day I, you know, I, sh I eventually share the photos of what I looked like at the finish. I looked, you know, like pretty done in. Um, but I was expecting it to be physically hard. And I trained really hard. Um, I trained six days a week, uh, a couple of couple of sessions a day. And I know some of you guys are local. So if, you, if you've seen a woman out with a, a tyre out on sort of Laverstock Hill or anywhere like that, that was me doing that at sort of crazy times, lying in rivers, all sorts of stuff. So it was while it was physically hard, it was as physically hard as I was expecting, but, but, but that was that. What I hadn't really 
and it's quite difficult to prepare for as well because you never know how it's going to unfold but what I hadn't really prepared for or or sort of appreciated was how mentally challenging it was going to be so there I was you know I set off the first two three days there was a really um, big storm on sort of day three four and after that it sort of gradually began to sink in that I was like oh I'm actually going to be out here for a really long time you know weeks and weeks and weeks and when you look at that massive distance the actual incremental progress I was making every day was tiny so I was doing I don't know 30 kilometers a day something like that which isn't which is you know not bad going and I was able to be incredibly consistent thanks to all the training but it still was you know it would take four or five days just to get to the next kind of milestone the next degree line and uh, just I'm a very impatient person naturally and just you know seeing how how long it was going to take and just <clears throat> ticking the days off so so gradually um, was really really difficult for me it was you know a massive challenge and it was you know there's always a temptation to you know um, just just call it in and say I've had enough come and get me which they would have done and quite a lot of expeditions finish that way before people get to the finish because and I, I thought that only seven women had done that journey because it's very expensive it's very inaccessible you need a lot of time off to go and do it but actually all of those things are true but it is just that it's incredibly hard work and having to work that hard every single day is uh, you know it's it's a daunting prospect um, so the mental resilience kind of tricks that I used um, and I honestly don't think that it's I'm the kind of person that goes and do, does an expedition I think it's the opposite I think that expeditions can change who you truly are so all the things that I've learned in, in my training weren't just how to put a tent up or um, you know how to make the cooker run it was how it was learning mental resilience and I honestly think it's like a um, it's like working any other muscle. It's like any other thing that you would do when you're when you're learning a sport that you can you can practice it. You can make it better just by doing those smaller things and by practicing it every day. And quite often that's doing things that you perhaps don't want to do, but that, you know, you need to do. Um, so that's why getting up at 5 a.m. and going and lying in rivers and all of those stuff, which might seem a bit pointless, just making yourself cold and wet for no reason in the training. It was all about kind of getting yourself to do things that were outside your comfort zone and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that really helped my mental resilience because I'd got that backup of having done lots of smaller things. I thought, yes, I know I can do this, or at least I knew I could do another day. And that's kind of how I talked myself into it. And there were whole weeks went by when every single morning I was crying in my tent thinking, I just want this to be over. This is absolutely awful. But I just say to myself, look, if you can just do one more day, then you'll be back in your tent. You know, in 12 hours, you'll be back in your tent. You have the cooker on, you'll have your nice meal to get, get ready for. Um, just do one more day. And sometimes it just came down to just do one more hour. Just do one more hour and then you'll be able to stop for a break. Just do one more hour and you can kind of treat yourself to that new audio book. So the mental resilience tricks of kind of breaking it down into much smaller steps really, really helped me as well. And uh, I, I think un knowing yourself, which kind of isn't necessarily something you can fast track, but really understanding kind of what what works for you and what doesn't. So <coughs> I know that I'm quite impulsive as a person. I, and that's probably why I ended up going, yeah, let's go to Antarctica. That'd be a good idea. Um, but I know that I have to rein that in. So I had a n I had notes written on the inside of my tent in Sharpie, notes, quotes, motivational um, sort of messages uh, and one of them was be methodical. So I, I almost kind of made a point of doing everything deliberately slowly. It probably wasn't particularly slow, but m to slow things down for me, because I know that's where I can come unstuck. And also I had another message that said that I'd written to myself saying, uh, stop crying and start skiing. Um, and s sometimes that's what works for me is just if people are kind of, oh, you know, poor you, just do what you can. Um that's actually kind of worse for me than someone going just get on with it you know and just knowing what what you can do what tricks you can do to kind of motivate yourself and what works for you so in terms of kind of resilience that might mean doing the most difficult thing first um, if that's what works for you or kind of working out a reward so um, I'd reward myself at the end of the day with like I had three tubs of Pringles for the whole trip and I should have had three tubs of Pringles for every week or something and I ended up rationing myself to like two Pringles a day but they became like this um 
kind of massive thing about you know you can get into your tent and then you can have your your two pringles um so you know res resilience partly is kind of knowing knowing what works for you i've got some notes here as well oh yeah i wanted to talk a little bit about um about failure um i think big expeditions and big kind of projects whatever that might be tend to be full of challenges and barriers and Shackleton said challenges are just things to be overcome after all and I absolutely believe that mindset uh, but I think a lot of the challenges and barriers so you know the things about not having any money and time and all that stuff they weren't the big challenges the biggest challenge was the mental challenge of saying I am going to do this um, and trying to overcome that kind of but what if it goes wrong what if I fail? And I think there's so much we can learn about failure. And I mean, I <coughs> I got loads of things wrong in training, loads. That's, you know, that's several talks worth of, um, you know, th things that went wrong and stories of where I was a complete idiot and didn't think and acted impulsively and all that kind of thing. But it's so important because if we, if I hadn't done all those things, I wouldn't have learned what works for me. I wouldn't have learned, you know, how not to do whatever it is, you know, and, and, and those those things really stick in your mind. So for me, failure is is so important to learn, you know, and, and I'd often think of failure, you know, I, I rarely see knockbacks as something negative. I always think, because I'm generally quite an optimistic person anyway, but I always think, what can I learn from that? What could I do, have done differently? What could I do better next time? Um, and so I think if we're not, if you're not at the point of failing at things, then actually you're not at the point of where your limits are. You're not fulfilling your potential almost. So being able to kind of, especially in the fundraising, the fundraising was a real kind of example of mental resilience, even before I got to the start point, because, you know, you go and speak to 20 companies and 19 would come back and say, well, why should we support you? In a, usually in a very nice way, not always, but usually in a very nice way. Uh, and you know you'd, you'd come out of a meeting feeling so buoyed up you know that went so well I'm definitely going to get the money from these guys they love it and then you, you just wouldn't hear anything and you'd kind of be thinking you know I'm never going to make this happen um, you know I, I can't do this the amount of money I need to raise is too great but you've got to work out how you can kind of learn from those things pick yourself up see that there are always going to be other opportunities open to you even if that one is closed and um you know that that kind of emo emotional roller coaster really kind of armed me for a lot of what was coming afterwards and a lot of people say that raising the money is almost harder than the expedition itself so um i i, I love a good quote so um i've got one here from c.s lewis uh, who you will all have heard of and he said that um hardships often prepare ordinary people for extraordinary things and I think that kind of wraps resilience up pretty nicely into how I feel about it. And it's, you know, stretching your comfort zone, stretching that muscle um, and building on that and doing things that are just a little bit outside your comfort zone. Uh, and then and then you you look back and you think, wow, my comfort zone was really small, you know, to begin with. I couldn't I could barely put a pair of skis on. Look at what I know now um, and and just kind of being always able to move forward and on the inside of my tent the uh, message that I looked at the most often uh, and the one that really kind of helped me the most was so simple and I think you you know you've probably all heard of Finding Nemo and it was kind of variation on that from this quite sort of deadpan Norwegian guide I said what's your advice and he I think half seriously but half joking he said um, well, you know, at the end of the day, all you can do is keep skiing. So I had this just keep skiing on the inside of my tent. And I can honestly say that was the thing that I kind of drew on the most is just, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes it's just putting one foot in front of the other and keeping going, which can kind of make you realise that you that you can keep going. And it's a sort of virtuous circle of um, really kind of understanding how how deep you can dig. Um, so I would I would congratulate you all on your um on your achievements for the year in these weird times and I would encourage you all to keep pushing at your comfort zone to not accept failure as a, as a knockback but a learning opportunity um, 
and to and to uh, to dream big because if I can achieve what I've done then anything is possible. Thank you Wendy. What an incredible achievement um, and some brilliant messages from Wendy and Marilyn today. Um, some of the, my favourites, particularly from Wendy, uh, get, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Stretch your comfort zone. Push your limits. Front up to failure. Learn from your mistakes. And dream big. How can you emulate these messages in your lives, girls? How can they help you with achieving your own goals in sports, but also in academic life and in other areas of your own lives? So much to think about. Uh, Wendy's kindly offered to come into school next year and do some workshops with the girls and we'll certainly look into doing this. Now, on to part two of our sports awards. Uh, we will hear from our senior captains Jess Rusby and Abby Littlejohns about lacrosse, Millie Pratt about netball and Lucy Pope and Ellie Coles about hockey. Over to you Abby. Hi, I'm Abby Littlejohns and I'm the vice captain of the first lacrosse team. This season in lacrosse, we put over 10 teams ranging from under 12 to under 19. Unfortunately, many matches this season were cancelled due to bad weather and many teams missed out on nationals and southwest tournaments due to the coronavirus. Our most successful team this year was our under 12 A's with the B's coming a close second. Our under 12 A's had an unbeatable season. This team showed determination and grit and it definitely paid off. The under 13 B's had a fabulous season with their highlights being beating St. Swithin's 8-7, smashing St. Mary's Khan and Cheltenham Ladies with an over 14 goal lead. An unfortunate end to their season meant no Southwest Rally. Still, we have high hopes for their upcoming season. The under 13 A's had a great start to the season, beating Cheltenham Ladies 13 2. They also played really well at Top Test Tournament, where they beat St. Swithins but unfortunately didn't make it to the next round due to a one goal goal difference. Despite both major tournaments being cancelled, some of their favourite moments were off pitch, deciding on team hairstyles and making playlists with Mrs. Edwards. The under 13 B's had some tough matches this year but remained resilient throughout the whole season and never gave up. These most their most notable performance was beating St Mary's Khan at the beginning of the season. The under 14 A's had a very successful season, winning 8 out of 11 matches. These included beating LEH, Guildford High, St Mary's Khan, and Sherburn. Their biggest success was winning the inter county tournament. They also had a very big success at nationals, making the semi finals. The under 14 B's showed massive improvement during the season in their skills, communication and most importantly, teamwork. This team has shown great dedication over the course of the season. When asked, both captains said they couldn't choose a season's highlight, but having the opportunity to play lacrosse each weekend was the highlight of each week. Thanks, Abby. Hi, I'm Jess. I'm captain of the first lacrosse team. So the under 15 A's had a great season this year, winning 9 of 13 matches. Some of their more notable performances were, both be were beating both LEH and St Swithin's. One of their favourite moments was their Christmas pyjama party with Mr Powell. The under 15A captains would like to say an extra special thank you to Jess Lucas, who unfortunately tore her ACL early on in the season, but was their best sideline supporter. The under 15Bs started out their season on a massive high beating Guildford. Although despite this, their season highlight was their final match against Sherburn, where they played against the under 18 Cs. This season, we put out three senior lacrosse teams. The Thurs had an unfortunate season, with many of their matches being cancelled. One of their season highlights was drawing with St. Swithins and beating Cheltenham Ladies 16 7. As much as it pains me to say this, the second season highlight was beating the first in a friendly training match at the beginning of the season. And it has to be said that we will never forget this painful fact as they got it printed on their nationals kit. The seconds also came third in West Rally and 11th at nationals despite the horrible weather. Off the pitch, they enjoyed making team TikToks. The first had a great season, both on and off the pitch. One of, the, one of our season highlights was winning a tri tournament, beating both Marlborough College and Cheltenham Ladies. We also had some fab team bonding experiences, which included pancake making and team brunch and pizza and team building the night before nationals. Nationals this year was a little unconventional with the first day being cancelled. But luckily for us, the second day was on and despite having a tough pool, we had such a fun day. Finally, I would like to say a massive thank you to all our fantastic coaches who never fail to show up and give us their all. And our parents who cheer us on in rain or shine. 
and last, but definitely not least, we would like to thank Mrs Edwards for her enthusiasm and commitment to all her teams over the years. And on behalf of every Godolphin lacrosse player, we will miss you very much next year. Hi, my name is Millie and I'm the first team netball captain. Netball this year has been very busy for all age groups, with achievements throughout the school. There's been over 30 cancelled matches creating a lot of disruption throughout the season. Despite this, the firsts, under 16 A's, under 14 A's and the under 13 A's all qualified for their respective county tournaments. So congratulations to all. Another all round success was that all teams beat Hampshire Collegiate School except for the under 12 A's who narrowly lost by one goal with their final score being 11-12. The under 12s have had some brilliant matches this year, with the A's beating South Wilts 24 and the B's beating South Wilts 6-0. Caitlin Miller, who's part of their team, has said that our under 12 teams are very strong and we cooperated well together. The team most enjoyed beating South Wilts as we trained very hard beforehand. Their coach Mrs Harvey has said that you are all an exceptional and committed squad and are a joy to work with. Both Izzo and I have thoroughly enjoyed coaching the under 13 since gaining our level 1 coaching qualifications. Both the A's and B's final matches were very successful, with them both winning against Trafalgar. I would highly recommend to anyone interested in coaching just to give it a go, as it's definitely increased my confidence in netball skills. The under-14s had a great county tournament, coming third in their section out of eight teams. They beat Marlborough 8-6, which is a very high achievement. They narrowly lost to Dauncey 3-4, and in the last 20 seconds lost by one goal to St Mary's Car. The under-14s captains, Poppy and Grace, thought the best part of their season was when Mrs Edwards promised them pizza if they beat Marlborough, which they did by two goals. They said that at the tournament there was so much positivity and a great team spirit. The under 15s have had some, out some outstanding matches against Hampshire Collegiate and South Wilts. Their coach Mrs Drummond has said that their new skills and new strategies were executed well in all the matches. The under 15s captain Clara Williams has said that the team had a great and enjoyable season with some amazing results in matches, so well done girls. The under-16s won the Salisbury Schools tournament and qualified for their county championships. They also had a great match against St Edmunds, winning 44-26. Mrs Drummond says that they all integrated well with the under-18s and the players that attended the extra sessions made exceptional progress. Also, well done to Charlotte Duncan, who continued her county training with Hampshire. Finally, the under-18s. The first team squad compete weekly at the Salisbury Adult League every Wednesday night, no matter what weather, rain, hail or wind. This requires commitment and dedication, which all the players have shown throughout the season. Unavailability to play did take its toll, but despite having multiple injuries and illnesses in the team, from Izzo's knee, my concussion, Tilly, Abby and Izzy's ankle injuries, we've continued to put up a brave fight. From this year, we can definitely clarify that netball is not a non-contact sport. We secured some excellent results against the adult teams and finished in a commendable third place in Division 2. Our coach Mrs Drummond has said that we are a joy to coach and are a happy, motivated and enthusiastic group of players. The high standard attained isn't just down to talent, but to commitment and consistency as well. Captaining the under 18s has been so much fun. I've enjoyed our training sessions and even if our Wednesday night league matches are very tiring, I'm sure we'll all agree that we've had lots of fun on and off the court, from pre-match Zumba to Izzo supplying our half-time popcorn breaks. Thank you to also our regular supporters, Mrs Horsfield and Mrs Pratt, who come to every Wednesday league match. Your sideline support means a lot. Another thank you to Mrs Edwards. You've done so much for netball at Godolphin, from doing all the tedious England netball forms to being at every Wednesday night match, either umpiring or cheering us on in a really mentally tough game. On behalf of the team, thank you for everything you've done. Your positivity will be greatly missed. Lastly, a massive thank you to Mrs Drummond. You're a fantastic coach, always helping us reach our fullest potential. From training sessions to our weekly matches, you continue to support us on and off the court. Your wise words mean more than you can ever imagine, so thank you for everything you've done. I know all the upper six will miss you greatly. Congratulations to all teams for your passion and dedication to netball. Despite the disruptions, your efforts remain consistent throughout the year, so well done to all. Hi. My name's Lucy and I'm the first team hockey captain. This year we've had some really great hockey across the board and played 39 matches in the autumn term. Unfortunately, due to coronavirus restrictions, we were unable to play our annual parent staff hockey match, but we all know who would have won. Our first team played six matches and scored nine goals this season. 
We won 1-0 against Claysmore and 5-3 against Swigs, and our top goal scorer was Grace Thompson with three goals. A highlight of the term was when we turned up to training, it started chucking it down with the worst rain I've ever seen, the lights broke so we couldn't see, and it was freezing, and then to top it all off, Paul Vian made us do sprints. The under-16s entered the Tier 1 Cup and were drawn against the formidable Clifton College, where we were ecstatic to get a goal, which I believe Lottie scored. They were knocked out into the plate round, where they had a much more even game, and they played exceptionally well. The under-15s played five matches with top goal scorer Olivia Huff. They had a tough season, but had some incredible games against St Mary's Khan 6-0 and St Mary's Shaftesbury winning 3-0. The under-14s have had a fantastic season with a very strong team. They played nine games and scored an amazing 29 goals. They qualified for the regionals where they were runners up and went on to the tier two national finals, the first good often team to ever achieve this. They scored an all but one game with Liv Gomesall holding the title of top goal scorer right up to the final. They've had a fantastic year and played some top level hockey. Well done all. Hi, my name's Ellie and I'm the hockey vice captain. This year, the under 13s had a tough season. However, they did score one particularly memorable goal. They worked hard together, loved the bus drives and improved hugely over the season. Captained by Emily Huff and B Halsey. The under 12s had a fantastic season, winning every single game. Over 24 girls regularly turned up to training. The B team improved hugely over the season, but it was the A's who scored a staggering 26 goals with none against them. Top goal scorers were Katie Gray and Annabelle Hall, who helped the teams to win against Swigs, Kings, Winchester, Farley, and a whopping 12-0 victory over St. Mary's Khan. We also have a number of girls who were selected for the County Junior Academy Centres. These include the following for Hampshire, Olivia Huff, Olivia and Indiana Gomeshaw, Josie Taylor, Pollyanna Jones and Tiana Namanisu. Also, Maddie Freestone Aves, Daisy Andre and Millian Ella Corbin for Wiltshire and Katie Gray for Dorset. Congratulations to Alice Appleton who has also been training at the Performance Centre. Well done to everyone who played hockey this term and thank you to our fabulous coaches Paul Vine and Miss Porkai and I look forward to seeing everyone on the pitch next year. Thank you, Ellie, uh, and thank you to all of the girls that participated in uh, those three sports throughout this year. I know there was quite a lot of disruption for team sports, uh, mainly due to the weather um, this year, and some of the nationals and finals were cancelled due to the pandemic. But nevertheless, um, and some really fantastic efforts from uh, the girls throughout the course of the season. Now. Uh, I'd like to announce the winners of the most improved and most valuable girls in each of those sports. So they are in lacrosse, the first team, most improved player, Hattie Dennis, most valuable player, Lucy Pope, second team, most improved player, Emily Otten, most valuable player, Clementine Butcher, third team, most improved player, Summer Walker Candy. Most valuable player, Georgie Way. Congratulations, girls. For the under 15s, under 15 A team. Most improved player, Pippa Sefton. Most valuable player, Lottie Miller. For the under 15 Bs, most improved player, Esme Finnis. And uh, most valuable player, Georgie Kett. In the under 14s, the under 14A, most improved player, Poppy Nolan, and the most valuable player, Tiana Namenisu. Under 14Bs, Tatiana Tiso is the most improved player, and Daisy Andre and Abby Godden, the most valuable player. Under 13s, under 13A, most improved player, Annie Oderston, and most valuable players were Emily Huff and Amelia Reed. Under 13 Bs, the most improved player, Eliza Hill, most valuable player, Alice Munro Bettinson. And for the under 12s, under 12 As, Amelia Winwood, most improved player, and most valuable player, Caitlin Miller. And for the under 12 Bs, most improved player, Lula Palmer, most valuable player, Flora Drake Burrows and Miriam Morgan. Congratulations, girls. My apologies for any names that I have mispronounced. Uh, in netball, 
For the first team, most improved player, Emily Otten. Most valuable player, Millie Pratt. For the second team, most improved player, Abby Littlejohns. Most valuable player, Jess Adlington. For the under 16s, under 16A team, most improved player, Jemima Bentley. And the most valuable player, Isabella Clapperton. Under 16Bs, most improved player, Fre Freya Hutchins. Most valuable player, Amy Lucas. For the under 15s, the under 15A team, most improved player, Lucy Dodd. Most valuable player, Clara Williams. For the under 14As, most improved player, Agatha Robb. Most valuable players, Poppy Nolan and Grace Wilby. For the under 14Bs, most improved player, Abby Godden. And most valuable player, Chloe Lemieux. For the under 13s, under 13A team, most improved player, Izzy Wolvert. Most valuable player, Lotta Williams and Amelia Johns. For the under 13Bs, most improved player, Scarlett Small. And most valuable player, Tyann Seema. And for the under 12As, uh, most improved player, Amelia Winwood, and most valuable player, Elsa Edgecombe. Congratulations, girls. Uh, and then finally, in hockey, uh, first team, most improved player, Olivia Jones. Most valuable player, Alice Appleton. In the under 15s, most improved player, Esme Finnis. In the, and the most valuable player, Olivia Huff and Lottie Miller. In the under 14s, most improved player, Alice White. And most valuable player, Tiana Namiensu and Pollyanna Jones. In the under 13s, most improved player, Tyann Seema. And most valuable player, Emily Huff and B Halsey. In the under 13 Bs, most improved player, Olivia Lloyd. And most valuable player, Abigail Bolston. In the under 12s, most improved player, Elsa Edgecombe. And most valuable player, Emily McDonald and Katie Gray. And the under 12 Bs, most improved player, Amelia Winwood. And most valuable player, Elodie Tissot. Congratulations to each and every one of you for all of your efforts and your successes and I really do appreciate everything that you've done. Finally, we move on to some of our major sport awards. Uh, these categories are annual awards that recognise effort as well as talent and performance for the school. The girls that win these awards display the behaviours and the attitudes expected of Godolphin girls, girls and could be considered role models. We have a few categories to go through. Uh, we start off with national awards. Now, these awards go to those girls that have received international honours or, in the case of this year, would have had the opportunity to had we not been in the middle of a global pandemic. So, those girls are Anna Merritt for athletics. She received an England vest last July, having come in second in the National Track and Field Championships. Ellie Chalk for her achievements in swimming. Chloe Lemieux for her achievements in equestrian. Isabella Clapperton for being selected for Scotland lacrosse under 19s and Lottie Miller for being selected for Scotland lacrosse under 19s. Congratulations girls, you should be very proud of yourselves. Our most improved award goes to a girl who has um, improved the most during the course of the year. Um, this particular girl shows great enthusiasm for sport and for physical activity um, and she's made a really strong contribution all round in hockey, in netball and lacrosse. Um, and this year the most improved athlete goes to Esme Finnis. Congratulations, well done. Then we move on to sports personality um, of the year. And again, this girl's this goes to a girl who has shown great personality throughout the course of the year. Uh, this particular girl is positive always. Uh, she's great to be around, according to her coaches, teachers and teammates. Um, she has an absolutely brilliant attitude. Um, she works hard, she's very humble and she puts the team first. 
Um, and Sports Personality of the Year goes to Izzy Gilligan. Congratulations. Finally, we're going to move on to Sports Women of the Year. So, uh, we had five nominees for this award, and they are Ellie Chalk for Achievements in Swimming, Chloe Lemieux, Alice Tregoning and Emma Jowett for their achievements in equestrian, and Anna Merritt for her achievements in athletics. All five girls should be very proud of their achievements over the past year, and this has been a very difficult decision for us to make. So much so that we have decided that two girls should be awarded Sportswoman of the Year in 2020, and those girls are Chloe Lemieux and Ellie Chalk. Congratulations, girls. I want to give you a little bit of a reason behind that. So, Chloe, following on from her bronze medal in the European Championships last summer, she has gone from strength to strength. Winning the Supreme Pony of the Year at the Horse of the Year show in October 2019 has been one of the highlights of Chloe's reading, riding career to date. No working hunter pony had ever won the Supreme title in the 70 year history of the show. <clears throat> It was a very big shock for Chloe, but congratulations. Her year started well with a sixth place in the under 16s championship at the Liverpool International. She was only 13 year, years old at the time. Chloe and her pony Freya followed this up, winning three classes at the Only Winter Show. In January and February, she stepped up to jump 1.4 metre classes for the first time and achieved three great clear rounds, placing third at Chard and fifth at Kiso. During the winter, Chloe gained two new rides and before the lockdown managed to compete once internationally at Peelberg and CSI in Holland, including a very good second place on Barika in an open class against adults. Probably Chloe's most notable recent achievement in show jumping has been her consistency. Up until COVID-19 halted everything, she had held the number one spot in the British show jumping children's national rankings for six consecutive months. She also had a front page on Horse and Hounds. Congratulations, Chloe. Ellie has been absolutely smashing it in the pool over the last 12 months. Um, at the Short Course Regionals in 2019, she qualified for six events and PB'd in all of those events. She qualified for the 50 metre freestyle final. In the Wiltshire County Swimming Championships in 2020, she was the county senior champion in the 50 free, breaking the age group record with a time of 26.88. She was also the senior county champion in the 100 free with a PB time and also in the 200, she came fourth in the 200 free um, and also PB'd in that event too. In the 50 back, she, achieved, she went to the senior county championship. In the 100 back, she came second. In the 200 IM, she came second in the county senior championship. And for the 50 breast, she is the county senior champion. Uh, and in the 50 fly, she came first in the 16-year-olds and second in the county senior championship overall. She qualified for the Olympic trials of 50 free that would have taken place in the London Aquatic Centre uh, um, earlier this year, but was cancelled due to the pandemic. She also um, uh, qualified for the final in the 50 free in the British National Championship last year. So, some fantastic achievements in the pool. Congratulations, Ellie. And congratulations, Chloe, and congratulations to both of you for being our Sportswomen of the Year 2020. Thank you. Uh, we're almost at the end. Uh, perhaps the most important part now is we need to recognise those people that are leaving. Um, and we've got a, a few ways of doing that this evening. And um, first of all, I just want to say thank you, really. Um, thank you to everyone that's... Um, everyone that I've met really during my first year or so at Godolphin. Um, thank you to the girls for being so friendly. Uh, thank you to teachers uh, for being so welcoming, particularly the PE staff who have really helped me and guided me through uh, my first year uh, of teaching and um, being at the school. Um, and thank you to parents. Uh, thank you to those parents that have supported uh, PE and sport at the school and for those that have been giving me feedback throughout the season uh, good and bad. Uh, it's all really useful and I encourage you, all of you, to come and speak to me when, you, when you're when you in the school. Um, 
Couple of uh, goodbyes as well um, from the staff. So uh, Mrs. Huff is moving on to become a house matron. She'll still be at school and we do hope that she'll still be involved um, with PE and uh, PE, uh, PE and sports in particular. Um, and uh, to Mrs. Edwards, who after a number of years is leaving us at the end of this academic year. Um, her enthusiasm, her commitment and her spirits will sorely be missed. Um, but we do wish you luck for everything in the future. Our leavers uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the school, particularly from the upper sixth, um, we've got a video that's put together by the girls, uh, for the girls, and that will be playing in a minute. Um, and we'd just like to say goodbye and good luck to all of the girls that are leaving uh, Godolphin uh, this summer. And we will close the show with um, our head sports scholar, uh, Izzo Norris. So Izzo has been at the school for a number of years. She's represented the school in all sorts of different sports and activities. Um, and she is, uh, has recorded a nice little piece about her experiences of sports at the school. And we thought that would be a really good thing to finish the show with. So from me, it's really thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoy the last section. Um, please do stick around and uh, thank you very much. Hi Lucy, this is just to say a huge thank you from all of us in the PE department. You've been a fantastic member of staff. Your dedication, commitment and um, your enthusiasm for your teaching has been second to none. You've been inspirational to us, to the girls and you will be sadly missed. Some of the girls have put together a little uh, tribute just to say a few of their thoughts and feelings and we wish you all the very best on your ventures new. If I had to describe Mrs Edwards using three words, I'd use kind, enthusiastic and bubbly. Thank you for being so encouraging in everything I've done. And for being enthusiastic and inspiring to us. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all the great advice and support you've given me over the last five years. Um, I could always count on hearing you above everyone else on the, on the sidelines. Um, you're going to be greatly missed by everyone for your passion and dedication you give to this school. So thank you so much. Mrs Edwards, thank you so much for supporting me with my netball for the past six years. Also, thank you for always bringing your positivity and your motivation to every single Wednesday night league match. I'm sure the whole team would agree with me that your motivation and encouragement from the sideline means more than you can ever imagine. You'll be greatly missed and we'll all see you very soon. Bye. My best memory of Mrs Edwards would definitely be going up to Birmingham for the English School's Athletics Meet in 2019. Um, an amazing experience that I got to share with her and also working alongside her on the Godolphin Athletics Challenge which has been amazing. Thank you so much Mrs Edwards for coaching the third team LAX this year. It's been such fun and thank you for keeping faith in us and keeping our spirits up when morale was lower than it could have been. Um, also, thank you very much for the cute little giraffe socks. <laughs> thank you very much.
Um, my name is Izzo, head sports scholar, and I'm feeling a bit hoarse, so please excuse me, I'm really sorry. Um, but how is everyone? Um, everything is a bit weird, odd, strange right now, and I hope everyone is well. Personally, I have found that lockdown has given me the time to reflect and think, and I am very grateful for that. In normal life, or when we're not in a pandemic, I struggle in prioritising finding the time to reflect, finding the time to evaluate and validate my thoughts and feelings. So I think this has been a good opportunity for myself and I hope for many others to focus on oneself without the external factors, stripping things back, resetting and recharging. A lot of my thoughts have, in fact, been centred around sport. A lot of this pattern of thinking being triggered whilst I was undergoing an MRI scan last month. For those unaware, I unfortunately suffered a knee injury late last year, so this year sports participation was not possible for myself. So. As I was lying there under this worry, scary machine, I was thinking, overthinking, as usual. What if I have to get surgery? What if I can't play sport the same ever again? What does sport actually really mean to me? This is the question I'll be attempting to answer today. I think the Olympic Values Education Programme, or OVEP, sums it up really beautifully. Sport is about the joy of effort, fair play, respect for oneself, others and the environment, the pursuit of excellence and the balance between body, will and mind. So, for starters, the joy of effort. For me, this is all about centering around the process rather than the result. And this is so important as I truly believe that success and happiness are a journey, not a destination. I believe a true sports person personifies the concept that the effort made to enrich the goals and objectives of health and physical education, physical activity, and sport is a labour of love inspired by commitment and dedication. In my life, I believe this is best represented by our first netball team and our experiences in the Salisbury Adult Netball League. Every week, despite the horrendous English weather and the late hour, far past Millie Kunz's bedtime, our netball team lay everything on the court, blood, sweat, and many tears. And at the end of each game, I go home elated, irrespective of the result, the chilling cold, and the scuffs on my knees. Because I adore the game, and experiencing it with the team I truly love being a part of. I'm deeply saddened that I'll never be able to play again with this team, but I have loved and will cherish the journey that we have been through together forever. Second, fair play. Fair play is a complex concept that comprises and embodies a number of fundamental values that are not only integral to sport, but very relevant in everyday life. Fair competition is the foundation. In fair competition, to enjoy the fruits of success, it is not enough to win. Triumph must be measured by absolute fair means, honesty and just play. However, fair competition is just one of the many building blocks that constitutes to fair play. Being honest and having strong moral <laughs> being honest and having strong moral principles are essential. Practicing sport within a sound ethical framework is vitally important if you aim to be a true champion. As Baron Pierre de Coubertin once said, the important thing in life is not the triumph, but the fight. The essential thing is not to have won, but to have fought well. 
In my life, when I think of fair play, tennis springs to mind. Without umpires, the outcome of a tennis match is completely dependent upon the decisions of the players themselves. Tennis players need honesty and integrity. One must also respect the call of the opposition, even if you disagree with that call, which I can find quite difficult, especially against St Mary's Khan. <laughs> One of my fondest memories of sport is when I stopped to help and comfort an injured girl in cross country at the county championships. I may not have won the race and may have forfeited the opportunity to have been selected for regionals, but I do not regret it in the slightest. Winning at the expense of going against your moral principles is never truly winning. Next, respect for oneself, others and the environment. For every athlete, playing by the written rules is mandatory and playing by the unwritten ones is a must. My personal belief is that you cannot be successful at a sport without respect, that there is a unique respect that is held for fellow players, opponents, umpires, officials and others that only a true athlete possesses. An example from my life comes from when I was competing in two events which clashed at the IAPS Nationals in Birmingham. I approached the long jump official and told him about my dilemma. Without a thought, he smiled and shook my hand, saying that he remembered me from a previous competition. On that day, he recalled that I was the only person who had ever shook his hand and thanked him. Hence, he allowed me to switch between the two events. I waved my hand when I got back to the long jump pit from my shot put and he slotted me right in there and then. I didn't miss a round of either events that day, receiving two medals and two PBs. This really proves how important it is for athletes of any sport to behave in an appropriate manner, both in and out of competition and in and out of the sporting arena. Another example comes from when I won the Southwest Championships. Another girl and a friend named Molly Hole was competing and she had beaten me in the majority of every other competition. However, on the day of the Southwest Regional Championships, I got the gold. It was a very tense competition, each of our throws outdoing the other. It came down to our very last throws and I came out on top by only three centimetres. After competing, we were straight back to being friends, hugging and smiling on the podium. Because after all, rivalry on the field does not exclude friendship. We respect each other and we respect and are happy for one another's achievements. This is what I believe sport to be all about. Penultimately, we have the pursuit of excellence. In order to progress, an athlete must be willing to grow facing and focusing on their failures. Failure will not kill you, but your fear of failure will limit you from success. So do not view failure as a negative. Failure is just a redirection. It simply means there is something to be learned or another direction to be taken in order to be better. So instead of coming up with excuses and tearing down teammates, a successful athlete will reflect on what they do and what they have done and will take ownership of his or her actions and learn from them. It's the will, not the skill, with pursuing excellence. It's hard. Not everyone can win. So what are you willing to do to be the best, to beat every other person with the same goal? In my life, I strive to be the first to training and the last to leave. I don't need people there in order to work hard because I don't do it for them. I don't do it for my image and their validation. I do it for myself. And I think that this is so important. Nowadays, it seems it matters more about your image than your actions. Focusing on taking a cool picture of yourself working hard in the gym for Instagram rather than focusing on working hard. 
Rely on yourself for approval, not the outside world. Working hard in silence and letting the success make the noise. So finally, on to the last, the balance between body, will and mind. I honestly cannot express how important I believe this to be. I think even in the 21st century, when people think of health, they think of diet and exercise. And of course, this is so important. But in actuality, that is only barely half of it. Healthy living is not just the physical. It is about the balance between your mind, body and soul. Meaning you can only truly be healthy when you nurture your whole self, including your physical, mental, emotional and spiritual needs. In my life, I have definitely experienced an imbalance. For example, as some of you may know, I have not been in school a huge amount these last four-ish years because some difficulties presented themselves. And when I started suffering from these issues all those years ago, I had no idea what was happening. I'd gone through some tough stuff prior to that, but I'd always managed to keep my head above water. I had never experienced anything like it before. And when I was able to play sport, I just couldn't perform. And this didn't stop. I felt like my life had just stopped. My dreams were collapsing to the ground and all I could do was watch. It, it was terrifying. <laughs> now, in the present, my biggest wish is that I could speak to that 14 year old. I wish I could convince her to reach out and speak to someone and to give herself a break instead of driving herself crazy, wondering what was wrong with her. Despite this, I am so proud of her. And I'm proud of my 18-year-old self still here today. 14-year-old me would have hoped I was a superstar athlete by now, about to jet off to university in the States. But I'm not, and I've learned that that's okay. I am currently in lockdown, in the middle of a pandemic, thinking, overthinking, but I think I'm feeling okay because I know there is a path out there right for me, somewhere. <laughs> um, so if you're an athlete, even if you're not, please think of the balance between body, will and mind. And if you're feeling a little bit imbalanced, Focus on that and give yourself time. I wish I had more time to speak about sport. However, I don't think any amount of time would be enough to encapsulate all that sport means to me. Plus, Mr Morton gave me a time limit. So, finally, I just hope that you were able to take something away from today about how incredible sport can be. I've played sport my whole life and the lessons and values it has taught me have shaped the person I am today. And I'm so lucky to have this outlet in my life. If you haven't really tried sport or haven't liked it up until now, I promise you that there is a sport, multiple in fact, out there that you will enjoy. So please trust me when I say sport is really awesome and definitely worth a go. Right, enough of me. 